ladies and gentlemen. Um, good afternoon, if you're hearing us from Japan or Asia, or good morning for the people that are in Europe, like myself. Welcome to the webinar. Also, welcome if you're hearing us at a later moment, after you have uh, downloaded the slides and the video recordings. Um, sorry. Uh, the title for today, for our webinar, it's called Due Diligence Activities in a Solar Transaction in Japan. My name is Marcel Langone and I'm Project Manager at Solar Plaza and I'm going to present our speakers just in a minute. Uh, but before, a uh, quick agenda. Uh, I will have uh, first uh, a brief introduction about uh, the company and our conference. Um, then uh, I, Eugene Roussin will talk and discuss about tax issues when acquiring project entities and also enti entity acquisitions and their tax impacts. And afterwards, we will have uh, David Vallejo from Solarich um, uh, discussing and talking about the methods to discover technical underperformance uh, before uh, buying an asset and their improvement after acquisition. We will have uh, later still some time for Q&A and we will end our webinar in approximately one hour. So please stay tuned. Um, again, my name is uh, Marcel Langone. I'm project manager at Solar Plaza. I work for the solar asset management uh, conferences in Asia and Latin America. Uh, in the screen, you can now see my details. So please feel free to get in touch with me if you would have any questions or remarks regarding solar asset management and any of our conferences. For those of you that don't know Solar Plaza uh, that well, uh, we are a global uh, information platform uh, with our mission uh, just highlighted on screen. Um, I would say that our main uh, business is uh, to organize uh, high-profile uh, B2B conferences and trade missions all over the world. And we have already organized more than 85 of those uh, conferences and trade missions in 25 countries around the world in the last 13 years that we have been uh, in operation. Uh, we have already a network of more than 60,000 solar PV professionals and growing every day. So this webinar today is a pre-call for our Solar Asset Management Asia conference. Uh, it's already the third edition. Uh, it's being held on the 8th and 9th of June, so one month from now, and in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, I would say this is the region's leading conference dedicated to solar operations and maintenance and also to assets and portfolio management. Uh, the conference is international, bilingual, uh, and it has a mix of attendees, both local and international. And we are expecting uh, more than 250 attendees from the whole uh, PV industry, uh, which means uh, from owners, investors, developers, to service providers and manufacturers. We will have uh, more than 50 leading experts on stage and, and uh, more than 50 sponsors and exhibitors at the show, including uh, our presenters of today. So right now I would like to uh, give a word of thank you to our conference sponsors for making our conferences, the webinars, and content that we provide uh, every day possible. So again, thank you so much for all our sponsors. Um, if you still haven't registered, but you wish to do so, uh, we have a special discount code for today, webinar 10, uh, which means we are going to have a 10% discount uh, for the first 10 registrations using this code, webinar 10. And also worth to mention that our early bird expires this Friday, 
the 12th of May. So if you still haven't done so, please uh, take use of this uh, discount code. Um, some practical notes before we start uh, our presentations today. Uh, if you would have any technical issues, I hope you don't, but please, if, if you have uh, technical issues, just use the chat box on your right. Uh, also, for the Q&A sessions, uh, please participate also through the chat box. And worth to note that the presentation slides and the recordings will be available afterwards. So you can see it later as well. So let's start right now. Our speaker, our first speaker is Eugene Roussin. Uh, he's a partner of the Transaction Advisory Group in the KPMG Tax Corporation. Uh, Eugene has been focusing on advising investors in respect to tax aspects of their investments in Japan. And since the introduction of the Japanese FIT, uh, he has spent the majority of his time working with solar and renewal clients uh, regarding their, the structure of their investments in Japan. So Eugene, I'm going uh, to make you a presenter right now. I'm going to unmute you. I'm going to give you the power right now. Uh, let me just put your presentation on and the stage is yours. Thanks, Marcel. Can, can everybody hear me okay? I Thanks, can Mark. hear you, Jean. Yeah, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, so as, as Marcel kindly noted, I'm going to be speaking today for the next couple of minutes um, on uh, some of the common issues that we see in connection with uh, you know, acquisitions of solar projects in the secondary market from a tax perspective. Uh, I know tax isn't everybody's favorite topic, so I'm going to uh, spare you know spare you guys the minutia of you know how a tax DD would normally be conducted in practice, and um, focus really more on some of the major structuring related points that we see um, primarily. Um, and because you know while that's specifically a, a, a tax DD related um, topic, I, I think in, in connection with acquiring assets on the secondary market, it's important to always think about um, you know. The, the acquisition structure being um, presented by the, the seller, how does that fit to the structure that we would like to use? Are there any issues with what they're proposing? And moving from that structure into um, you know, most efficient structure for us going forward. And these are all things that should be considered in the early stages in accordance with the tax DD and performed at the same time because you know, they have the same kind of impact on pricing and, and how we should be thinking about the, um, the, the deal. Um, I think as just to kick things off, uh, we have our one poll um, for, for my section, and uh, this is kind of more for, uh, you know, we're also interested in this as well. Uh, Marcel, can you fill the poll, thanks? Yes, I um, will launch the poll just right now, and then we can discuss on the results. So the question that we'd like to kind of pose to everybody out there is, uh, for those of you who have been involved in looking at um, secondary market acquisitions, um, What's the most common acquisition structure that you have seen um, sellers um, yes, push or um, suggest? So yeah. the, the possible answers, let me read it for you, Eugene, are asset sale, acquisition of equity in project company, acquisition of TK, Tokumei Kumiai, interest in project company, or other. Please vote. We are giving it a few seconds before we uh, show the results. Let's wait. Uh, let's wait some more seconds. Okay, let's go to the answers right now. And Eugene, if you can comment on those, thank you. Uh, can you see the? Can you see the results, Eugene? I'm going to read it for you. So asset sales, 21% uh, uh, of our audience answer. Uh, we have 50% 
that people that believes acquisition of equity in project company, 0% for the TK and 29% for other. And I think that's that's um, that's in line with with what we've seen as well. Um, I think the majority of the deals that you know clients that we work with are, have been looking at um, involve the seller interested in trying to exit via sale of the equity in the project company. Um, the others is quite interesting. I, I didn't. I was not really sure what other um, action instructions would would fall. Um, you know, would be possible. So maybe that's something we can talk about in the Q and A. Some some people who have said that they. Yeah, I've seen other uh, forms of structures. Um, you know, we can maybe talk through that. But um, this fits in well with the, with the remainder of our presentation because, again, I think um, access of equity has definitely been something that, um, that that's very prevalent in, in the secondary market. And there are some tax implications along with that that just need to be taken into account when um, looking at these kind of structures. Um, so maybe moving to our first slide. Can I do that, Marcel, or is that? You have control, Eugene. Please go okay. forward. Um, so I guess the first point is um, wherever possible, and this is just speaking from a pure tax perspective, there's obviously commercial reasons and, and legal reasons why other active structures may be preferable. But from a tax perspective, it's always going to be beneficial to acquire assets if possible. Um, and the primary reasons for this are, first, you, um, in most cases, you don't have to worry about contingent tax liabilities in, in association with the assets. If the seller has done some kind of funky tax structure and has taken um, you know, some aggressive positions, for example, with respect to how they structured the, uh, the deal to date, if you acquire the assets, those are not things that we would normally inherit. Um, there's, uh, with an asset acquisition, there is no inside-outside basis difference, and I'll be getting to this point um, on the following slides in a little more detail. Um, it does provide more freedom for structuring as well. Uh, for example, um, I think many of you are familiar with TK structures, don't make the structures, um, which tend to be very popular for solar investments, especially um, if you talk about um, domestic fund type investments as well as investments from, from overseas. Um, if you're acquiring assets, that allows you to set of an acquisition vehicle via TK um, in, in the way that we would, you, know, you would normally ideally like to do that and uh, just have that entity acquire the assets. It's a very clean and straightforward structure as well. Um, and uh, there's also more freedom regarding um, how the purchase price paid for the asset is allocated amongst um, you know, the, the specific assets, the, the hard facility assets versus um, you know, goodwill or rights or things like that. Um, that's important from a tax perspective because that allows us to potentially mitigate, for example, uh, depreciable assets tax, which um, I think as a lot of people are, are now finding is a, is a fairly significant tax cost um, for these projects. Um, that being said, um, I think what a lot of you probably run up across is that in practice, asset acquisitions are um, often not what the, what the seller wants uh, and, and are often uh, more difficult from a commercial or execution perspective. Um, some of these reasons are due to, you know, we need to, there's a lot of different, you know, permits or agreements or, you know, the FIT, uh, PPAs, things like that, that would all need to be assigned uh, in connection with an asset acquisition. Um, there's some execution risk there if we need to go out and get consents from um, counterparties, and it also um, increases the execution timeline. Um, there may be negative tax implications for for the seller from doing an asset ac acquisition. The reason for that is, you know, if there's a gain um, that's going to be recognized at the project company level, um, subject to corporate tax um, at 28 to 35 percent, depending on what stage the uh, the uh, project is at at that point in time. Um, especially for like an like a uh, individual uh, who is resident in Japan, they would suffer full taxation in that scenario because the dividend that they would be getting from the company after tax would be subject to 50% or upwards of 55% um, individual tax at their level as well. Um, so they would much prefer to do a, uh, like an equity sale. Uh, another reason is, um, you know, if there's existing financing on the asset already, that means if we're moving the asset, we have to unwind that if, you know, if there may be break costs associated or we have to have discussions with the lender if there are restrictions on, on things like that in, in the current loan agreement. So, 
Uh, all reasons why uh, asset acquisitions are um, more difficult or can be more difficult in practice, and why um, you know equity or structure level sales um, are often preferred. So moving on. Uh, next couple of slides, I'm going to be talking about so too far, uh, on the inside-outside basis point that I mentioned earlier. Um, what, what I mean by inside-outside basis is that uh, when we acquire equity in a project company or you know a TK investment in a project company rather than the asset itself, um, the book value of the asset does not get stepped up uh, for tax purposes. And I have an illustration on the next slide to walk through that. But what that means is um, the the price that we pay for the shares is going to be higher because now we're paying a premium, which is going to be the case. It's going to be higher than the book value of the asset at the project company level, um, which has some negative tax implications um, going forward. And just to illustrate that. Um, next slide, I have a simple numerical example. Um, so let's say the seller has set up the target company, um, project company, as, uh, as a straight equity investment. They put in 100 equity. That equity has been deployed to um, develop a solar asset that's now worth 100, or, or the book value of that is 100. Um, and now we've come in to acquire that, uh, uh, that company from, from the seller. At this point in time, the asset value, you know, it's a completed asset, now it's worth more. Um, the fair market value of the asset at this point in time, let's say, is 150. Um, so, and assuming that we can equate the fair market value of the asset with the value of the equity, um, just to make things simple, we're assuming that the equity is also worth 150 in this case. Um, so, as a result, from the buyer's perspective, um, the buyer's basis in the investment is 150 in the equity. Um, Whereas the target SBC level, as I mentioned, because the value of the asset does not get stepped up in connection with a equity sale, uh, it remains at 100. And then let's say we immediately turn and we look to flip the asset. And um, we look to flip the asset by selling the asset to, for example, REIT, um, because REITs, for all practical purposes, can only acquire an asset. They can't acquire shares. Um, there's a lot of different regulations on what a REIT can and can't do. Um, what happens in this case is, um, and let's just say, for example, that we sell the asset immediately for 150, so the fair market value of the asset when we acquire the equity. Um, what happens in this case is at the target SBC level, we have a taxable gain of 50 because the asset basis was not stepped up. This is subject to corporate tax at, let's say, 28% because it's an operating asset. That means there's 14 of corporate tax leakage. Um, that means the net cash flow to the buyer is only 136, so even though from the point from which we bought the equity to the point we sold it, there was no actual economic increase in the value of the asset. We're getting less money back. And that's that's really the impact of the, the inside-outside basis. Um, in, and normally, you you know, if it was a scenario where you'd be buying equity and then immediately looking to flip the asset, um, this, a buyer would never pay 150 for the equity. The buyer would pay 136 because um, if you're assuming an asset sale, you have to account for the inside-outside base and provide a discount. Um, and for example, in the real estate world, where um, you know there's a considerable amount of terminal value, capital gain um, on a on the future sale of the asset is a large driver of the, of the deal economics. Um, you know, people are very conscious of the inside-outside basis difference. Um, that being said, in, in for solar, it's a little bit different. Um, and from what we've seen um, in a lot of the transactions that we've worked thus far on, on, the, on the secondary market, um, it's not that common for the, a, a, a difference to be priced in for the inside-outside basis. And we think there are a few reasons for that. Um, I think one of the primary drivers is that just right now it's a, it's a seller's market. And so, um, you know, if, if there's a host of suitors for a specific asset, um, Obviously, the seller has more leverage regarding pricing, and the buyers have to um, act accordingly. Um, but there's a few other reasons why it's it's likely not as much of an issue for a solar investment. Um, one is um, 
because, as I mentioned, the, the depreciable asset tax is a pretty considerable um, operating cost for these deals. Uh, if there, if we transfer the equity, that means the asset value does not get stepped up, but that also means we inherit the historical basis for the purpose of the depreciable asset tax, which means lower depreciable asset tax going forward as well. Um, so that's one cost savings. I can help kind of offset some of that inside-outside basis difference. Um, the other, I think, major driver of this is that um, it's an, unlike a real estate deal, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, the end, the end, a long-term investor in a store project is not looking at terminal value. They're looking at getting cash flow over the, over the life of the project. And what that means is um, that inside-outside basis is still going to exist, but it's going to represent itself or uh, it's going to be manifested in the form of lower depreciation taken over the life of the project. So instead of having that hit, as in my previous slide of, um, of 14 of tax in the following year, um, that's going to be spread out over 20 years, so the IRR impact may not be as significant, and as a result, it doesn't get priced in, um, in the way that you would see it in potentially other asset classes. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, well, I think what we want to talk to here is that, um, as I mentioned, I think a lot of people are, um, I think a lot of our clients, um, you know, are interested in using TK structures because they're generally more tax efficient um, than, than an equity structure. Um, so the next question is, if the seller is looking to sell equity in their project company, um, how easy is it to convert that essentially into a TK investment? And there are some difficulties with that. Um, the primary difficulty is that if we're selling, if the seller is looking to sell the equity for a high premium, that limits the extent to which we can put a TK investment into the project company after acquisition um, and limits the extent to which we can allocate the business to the TK investor, which means more of it going to the TK operator, um, a less tax efficient structure. Um, one way that um, you know this can be um, simulated somewhat is if um, it's possible to convince the seller to um, decrease the premium that's being paid for the equity and ex instead have more of the premium paid out via development fees because in that scenario we could have the development fees funded via TK and by doing so work to essentially allocate more of the business to the TK investor and get a more effective tax rate. Um, for an operating asset, obviously, you know, there's no development fees to be paid out at that point because it's already been completed. Um, that becomes more difficult. And for a lot of operating assets, if we're looking to put a TK in, it may be necessary to consider a, a merger structure, whereas, whereby we uh, fund an acquisition vehicle with a TK, acquire the shares from the seller, and then merge to kind of try and push that TK investment into the project company where the asset is. Um, so those are the kind of major, I think, structuring points that we've seen to date um, in connection with um, having to acquire uh, equity in a project company, which is not ideal, but um, you know there are there are things we can do to to structure around that or try and make it work. Um, a few other just kind of points that we have seen come up in in other deals to date. Um, one is um, just making sure that when we look at the project company, um, there's obviously been a lot of costs that have been expended to um, you know, pay for the construction, development of, of the asset. Um, have these been properly accounted for? Have you know, if the amount has come from the shareholder, has it been properly accounted for as equity or as a payable or debt of some kind? If it's a payable or debt, um, you know, what's the interest rate? Are we comfortable that um, you know we're not creating a scenario where we should have deemed interest? Um, so just kind of making sure that the the accounting ties out with you know the funds that have have actually come through and been used and, um, to develop the asset. Um, another point that comes up quite often is, um, you know, with a lot of these development projects, a lot of the, the actual development expertise may not be in Japan. It may be, um, you know, offshore at, at the mothership, um, where that happens to be. Um, and as a result, um, you know, the economic um, reality may be that, you know, if there are development fees being paid out, a lot of these development fees should be earned by the, the offshore 
company where you know some of the more value added work is being done. Um, and this is also a pretty favorable uh, tax structure for a lot of sellers because um, development fees to the extent the the work provided in return for those fees was not performed in Japan um, should prima facie not be subject to tax in Japan. But that fact makes you know if there are large development fees being paid offshore. Um, that means that we're getting taxable basis in Japan, but not subjecting those fees to tax in Japan, which means it's something that tax authorities could take a lot of interest in. And so if there are large development fees being paid offshore, um, are, how comfortable are we as the buyer that, because we will be you know, assuming any kind of tax liability associated, that we can support the fee payments, that there is a, you know, there is a paper trail in there, um, that clearly indicates what work has been done by the offshore counterparties. Because um, if, if we can't do that and there's large payments being paid, paid overseas, um, there is risk of you know whether that those amounts will be deductible in Japan. And on my last, my last slide, I, I just a few other kind of um, more housekeeping level points that, that are pretty important. Um, first is, uh, has the project company filed to be a blue form taxpayer for Japanese tax purposes? Um, what that means is you have to make an application to be a, a blue form filer. Um, normally this is made you know, in connection with the, the entity being set up. Um, if you forget to do this, what it means is for any year that the entity is not a blue form tax filer, um, it loses the ability to carry forward net, operate, net operating losses that are generated for tax purposes. So you know, if there's been losses created in the first couple of years of connection with development and we're not a blue form filer, we lose those. That should be taken into account um, you know, when, when pricing and thinking about how much the project company is worth. Uh, the next is uh, consumption tax election. Um, you, the entity needs to be a consumption taxpayer in order to credit and ultimately receive a refund for any kind of consumption tax uh, incurred in connection with um, construction expenses and things like that. Um, so just making sure that that filing has been done appropriately and within the right time frame. Um, and the last point is it goes something I spoke to on the first slide is, is asset allocation. Um, has the seller taken a very aggressive um, position with respect to how the, the different costs should be allocated amongst the assets? Um, you know, are we comfortable with what's been done to date and that it's supportable going forward? Um, and that Includes my comments um, on some of the you know some of the major um, tax related uh, things we've seen come up um, in a lot of a lot of the secondary market transactions we've done today. Um, I'm sure I hope that some of you have questions on that, and I think we can address that at the Q and A section. But um, until then, thank you very much. Thank you so much for your insights, Eugene. Uh, before we move on to the next speaker, I, uh, I have already a question for you if you can comment on this. So uh, how would you expect the secondary market for solar assets to evolve? And if it will soon become uh, less of sellers uh, in the market? So what else will change? It's a good question. I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the reasons why solar assets are so popular is that, you know, they, they're yielding investments and there's fewer and fewer of those, you know, Real estate, especially, I mean, not just in Japan, but, but worldwide, is, um, you know, we, we've seen cap rate compression to the point where it's like, well, well it doesn't really have a lot of room to, to, to go anywhere else. Um, so I think there is a lot of global demand for products like this, which do have, you know, steady income streams that, that, that do yield, even though we aren't, we aren't looking at terminal value. Um, I think another big factor that could have a determinant in this is just kind of what happens with the public REIT market? Um, you know, there's been some listings to date. Um, I think interest, at least from, from what we've seen, has, has waned a little bit. Um, but if that takes off, um, you know, I think the, the REITs will need to um, continually be fed new assets to, to maintain stock price and, and, you know, have acquisitions that, that are creative to yield. And, um, you know, and if that happens and there are more and more REITs in the market, um, you know, that, that could kind of buoy um, demand for, for assets. Um, so it, I mean, it's, it's just kind of hard to tell right now. Another question. Do you expect many more 
R E I T S to start soon? I'm sorry, the the reads you were referring to? Oh. Yes. Sorry, what was the question? If do you expect many more reads to start soon? Um, I, again, I think that's it's, it's hard to say. I think there is a bit of a, a wait and see attitude. Um, you know, the, the first um, there was initial success, and then I think um, you know pricing has suffered a bit recently. So I think there is a question of you know, well, um, you know, what the, what's the best play going forward? Um, and and what it is, what's the kind of, I guess the, the secret sauce to to uh, garner investor interest going forward. So. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Eugene. Uh, stay on for Q and A's later. We will now. Uh, I will now make uh, switch for the next presenter. Uh, it's a totally different topic, so we will approach. Uh, um, due diligence uh, on the technical perspective. Uh, so, uh, David, I'm going to make you to give you the power right now and unmute you. Um, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Ye yes, I can hear you. Okay. So many thanks. So let's go to the to the technical part. Uh, well, our our attendees will be a mix of uh, financial and technical experts. So I will try to be uh, at the the middle level. Just try to be things not too complex for the financial attendees. And and sorry for for the technical experts. I will try to to be not uh, not too much detail because it should be uh, good enough for for everybody for all the attendees. So uh, very briefly, I will. This is the the index of the, my presentation. I will just explain a little bit about what the, what we are doing Solaric in Japan mainly, and then uh, we will have uh, three main points. One is the the preliminary considerations. I want to talk a little bit more about this than than should be standard in these sort of presentations because the most of the problems coming from the technical due diligence would be for the lack of the the right information and the right uh, collection of the of the different preliminary uh, parameters and the different uh, things that must be considered uh, in the before proceeding with the technical due diligence and then we will uh, talk a little bit about the what is the the standard scope and schedule for this sort of technical due diligence and finally some of the co uh, contents of the typical report and, and conclusions that we can provide as, as a technical provider assessment. Okay, so Solaric is a, a service, uh, a global uh, service tailor provided. So we, we have our own investment in Europe. Uh, we have assets in, in Italy and Spain, uh, totally 35 megawatt. But basically we are providing develop, development, construction, and operation and maintenance services globally. Uh, as you can see there, it's like we have more than achieved more than 200 megawatt uh, Turkey in, in different countries, and we already achieved more than 1.2 giga operation and maintenance globally. Uh, these are the different uh, countries where we have uh, offices, and, and of course in, in Tokyo we are based since uh, 2012, and now we have 45 people in the, divided between Tokyo and the, and the different parts of Japan, as we can show you here. So uh, a part of our office in, Japan, in, in Tokyo, so we have people basically involved in the operational maintenance in these regions. And we is a combination of electrical workers plus uh, chief electrical engineers that we are providing in the different places that we are uh, handling the operational maintenance. So this is the sort of uh, business units activities that we are providing. So everything that is needed for, for the investors is uh, on for the different owners of the assets is that, that we are providing, of course, covering preventive and corrective actions. We are making the monitoring system, control 
uh, at, the, at three different levels, locally by our electrical workers and team leaders in the different areas, covering by the backup here in the monitoring center that we have in the Tokyo office, and of course, like a third level of control in our headquarters. Uh, we cover the communication system management, security management when required, retrofitting, uh, energy production control that we integrate in the, in the monthly report, different uh, voltage management uh, of the different equipments, different indicators required by financial investors or asset management, etc., etc. Uh, of course, it's very important as well in order to secure and to warranty response time, we are covering spare parts inventory, and we already have uh, three different warehouses in, in, in different locations and different regions of uh, Japan. Uh, we use IBM Maximo as a professional way to handle uh, big pipelines. So this is like internal uh, tool that we are providing and we integrate all the preventive schedules, all the spare parts and all the corrective actions that we proceed. We, uh, using this system, this platform, allow us to give access to the technicians to the different instructions, to the different scheduled activities on a weekly basis. And we can see the different deviations uh, from the pre uh, expected uh, preventive actions. And we can really analyze in a very proactive way what is going on and how we can implement it proactive actions in order to handle the assets of the different investors. So let's go for the different preliminary considerations that, uh, that is really needed to, to be assessed uh, when we need to face a, a technical due diligence. So I really summarize in these five elements. So let's go uh, to go specifically uh, the first one. The most important thing uh, at the beginning is like the order that we I include here is like because I really think that this is the, the order that we must focus before we start uh, a technical due diligence. We need to know who is the uh, the role of our client. It is the lender, it is the IPP, it is the potential buyer. Which are the, the advisors involved technically, financially, uh, legally, and who is the EPC and the IN contractor. I mean, the identification of all the key key people in the with a different role is so important because many things will be required uh, specific clarifications or yeah many times uh, things could be solved very easily if there is a, a really uh, fluently contact with them right so it is something very relevant that have all the key person available in order to succeed in order to comply with the due date expected in the in the technical due diligence and in order to have the most of the the most uh, cl cl clarifications and the most conclusive uh, conclusions uh, in the in the result uh, that we will provide to the client the next and it's very important is a um, uh, really a uh, what is the real status of the project of course uh, we are assuming that in the most of the cases, we are talking about assets that are already operative. But of course, if we assume that we are not in the design phase and we are not in the construction phase, it is very important to understand what is the specific status. It is just a project already connected in the last days or the last week. If they already passed the, the PAC test, what is the provisional acceptance certificate, very, very standard different tests and different uh, proofs that need to be done, or it is already a project that already expired the warranty of the APC contract, uh, contractor, and then the final acceptance certificate already been released. So to know these specific details is very important because of course, the amount of uh, potential problems would be different and would be, we need to, to really to to understand these things uh, before facing specifically the due diligence. In this slide, what we can see is uh, the different elements that will be provided by the APC contractor. It is important to know what, which is the responsibility of each player. Of course, our duty as a technical advisor, as a, when we are executing this technical due diligence, 
is to understand uh, to understand all the different elements or the different equipments or the different service that we is this provided in the different contracts and to analyze it is compliance or uncompliance uh, with regards of the APC provider, with regards of the equipment manufacturers, or with regards of the operational maintenance contractor. So it's important to understand that, of course, uh, in the APC, we have uh, uh, the contract will have some PR, a warranty. It is something that we are providing in all our projects in, in Japan. If there's any availability warranty, it is any response time. Uh, it is a chief electrical engineer that we do need to interface with them of course the different equipments and of course uh, we need to understand as well which is the warranties of the different equipments in which conditions were signed those warranties so how many years what is the after sales responsibility of the different equipments so all those elements must be very carefully analyzed in detail before making the site visit of the technical due diligence and of course these are specifically the responsibilities of the operational maintenance. So uh, the, um, the due diligence, the technical due diligence, the target, again, should be to analyze everything, okay? Depend in, in which status of the, of the operational states we are. So we might be more focused in one part or in the other, but it's to cover everything, the responsibility of all the players involved. So then this is the whole amount of information that we require. Basically, uh, on, the, on the left of this presentation, of this slide, is all the technical information uh, of the design, plus the procurement details in terms of the specification of warranties. And on the right, it's important that, of course, if we need to take a, a, a good quality of the conclusions, we really need to analyze the contracts of the APC and operational maintenance. Of course, the commercial terms could be hidden for us. This is not relevant. And, and of course, we need to, to, to get access to the monitoring system in order to analyze what is going on on a daily basis. And really, to, to this will be really be much more effective in order to, when we make the site visit, we can really focus when we know that the problems are would be very handy as well if we have access to the historically uh, data and incidents. And of course, we must be double check if there is any uh, further information that would be relevant that we have in advance. Okay, and these are the... Uh, yes? Before we go on, uh, I think we, we have a poll question uh, regarding our last uh, slides. Yes. Yeah, go um, ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, we will be putting the the poll in a second. Uh, so I'm going to read the, the question. Uh, when you're facing a technical due diligence, how long does it take for you to collect all the information required as just explained? So you can uh, indicate more than one answer here and the answers are a few days. I do not have a clear idea. I would ne need to check firstly. So probably weeks. Uh, C is a few days, but I'm sure I'm not sure if all documents are updated as built version. Then D, the collection of the information is not that difficult, but to find the register of incidents plus granting monitoring access may take some time. Or E, is all that really needed? <laughs> so. Please uh, vote. We'll, we're going to have uh, the poll questions results in some seconds. Can we already show them? Please keep voting. Okay, so we have the results here. Uh, David, I don't know if you're seeing the, the answers. I'm going to read it for you. So, yeah, yeah I, can, I, can, I, I can comment. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, well, I mean, this is more or less what, what I would expect, no? It's like, um, uh, of course, in order to make the work easy for the technical advisor, uh, the, the answer that makes our life really easier is, uh, 
is a D or really A, right? So it's like uh, only 9% of the cases <laughs> we will have all the information and all the access granted in time. So uh, that makes that, uh, that of course, is like uh, in the most of the cases, uh, it is a certain time constraint in order to have uh, the results and the conclusions of the technical uh, due diligence in time and we are normally facing constraints of uh, a few weeks or one month. So uh, trying to anticipate and trying to make this uh, information ready uh, helps a lot. And of course, will be that the, the time dedicated in the site visit and the time dedicated to analyze the, the information in advance it is so critical and makes a uh, much more effective the technical due diligence. We can go back to the, the presentation. Yeah. Yes, we can. So, so yes, I will just go a little bit quicker. Uh, of course, the 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 project constraints are those elements that uh, that of course also focus and narrow a little bit. Uh, which are the the main elements that we must focus on on, on the due diligence? No, so all these uh, potential uh, potential uh, elements that happen in the different in the different assets. So it should be um, really uh, relevant that we we have answer in advance because it really will support a lot. Uh, when we mention here, for in, for instance, environmental constraints. Uh, do we have a, a problems with the snow uh, last winter? Do we have any specific problems related uh, at dusty area? Do we have any problems with the neighborhood that may may have problems to to resource to to find uh, electrical workers or to go around? So there are many specific things that we can uh, we should be able to collect on a case by case basis, and of course that the the client or some of the the players. Uh, would be would be possible to 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 help and to support on on these questions that I'm making here. Okay. So of course, um, uh, at the end is like uh, uh, we can offer like a standard and a very uh, broad scope of the uh, as a purpose of the assessment, but it might be also very good to understand if there is any specific. A request from the client. No? I mean, we we must be focused a little bit more on on what is going on in the production. Of course, the standard. What why is the the reason of that them performing? But maybe it's more about to to detect or to make a follow up of a punch list uh, coming from the from the EPC or really maybe different different main uh, purpose of the assessment. And of course, it's, it's good that, to understand what is the specific uh, client request on on this. On, on every uh, technical due diligence. Okay, this is just uh, to give an example about the what is a, a standard proposal in order to, to how quickly and uh, how uh, how much how long does it take in order to provide really an effective uh, and a com comprehensive uh, due diligence. So of course, contract negotiation should be uh, very easy as far as the 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 scope is, is is standard what is offering the standard uh, market the collection of information let's say we assume that the uh, pushing internally to the different departments the client will be able to provide everything in in one week then we we should need a couple of weeks to analyze everything in advance to review the incident reports to review the the monitoring system and the different contracts and the different specifications Site visit could be two, three, five days, depend on how big is the, the project and how many incidents we need to, to analyze. Of course, we, we need to, to make the site visit uh, ideally when Sundays uh, would be sunny days because this, this gives us more inputs and make, uh, will lead to easily to take uh, more co uh, effective conclusions. And then after the site visit, we will need a further technical review of all the collection of, of the test on, on, on the site. And in a couple of weeks, we'll have the, the, the report with the conclusions. So basically, we are talking here about once the contract is signed, we should be in something like five weeks, should be a standard for a full 
uh, full due diligence as far as the collection is not deleting, delay, uh, delay more than one week. Okay, so at the end on site, uh, this is of course like a very standard uh, proposal. It's like of course there is visual inspections of the different elements. Of course, we make uh, different tests, IV tests, a thermography could be by drone, the different elements, module, combiner box, uh, inverters, transformers. We make irradiation measures. Uh, we use these basic equipments, but of course, this could be uh, specified uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. David, we, we have another poll question, I believe. Do you want to make it right now? Yes, sure. Sure. Okay, if we go uh, back to our uh, previous slides, uh, I'm going to uh, give a, a short, uh, a short uh, description before our question. So, assuming uh, assuming that Solarig receive all the information required, as you can see on screen, and enough time is granting to analyze before and during the site visits, and no hidden elements arise. And now our question, which of the below are real conclusions that Solarig can explain in the technical report of due diligence? And here you can only choose one answer. Um, we have opened uh, the poll. Let's wait for some seconds for the answers. Um, so environmental factors affecting performance, if you think is that votes, material endemic problems, underperformance caused by EPC or O&M contractor, um, offer a potential upgrading of the PV sites and increasing the PR, or all the above. Do we already have? Okay, let's see the answers. David, can you comment on, on our results? Yes, yes. So, of course, uh, the, the right answer is the, the last one. All the above are possible. Uh, in our experience, I mean, we, this is a, a service that we offer uh, frequently, in, not only in Japan, in, in other countries. And, of course, it's like, basically, it's, it's more about what, what I was focused before. No? As far as we have the, the time and the collection of the, the right information, uh, we really can provide uh, some, some really answers and some really detect problems related to everything, related environmental factors, related endemic problems with the materials, let's say modules, let's say cabling, and, and of course, uh, even underperforming or uncompliance of the of the APC and OIN contracts in place. And of course, uh, what is much more important, and this is for us, the main target of the of the technical due diligence and especially in the in the secondary market of course we are offering a potential upgrading of the pv site and we just uh, mentioned what is needed to to modify on this on the site what is the uh, investment that is needed to be done in order to guarantee a higher performance of the of the plant and uh, that makes sense in order to the potential uh, a buyer in order to have a, an asset that is going to not underperform anymore and should be a good point also to the to the seller in order to have a, some a technical support and an OIN contractor in place in order to 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 give a added value to the, the potential underperformance. Okay, so let's let's go back to the to the last slide. Okay, so yeah, last last couple of slides. Yeah, uh, at the end is like this is uh, the different uh, the different parameters that uh, that we can detect. No, I mean we can really see a, a, in these three columns. It's like we really, really kid it, we, sorry, we really can uh, prove where the problems come. I mean, if the problems are related with these different factors that we mentioned here would be responsibility of our own design on our own APC contractor. So these things can be detected and have been detected in our experience. If there is a problem with availability, it's maybe a lack of uh, resources. So there is a problem with the snow, duty, different hot spots. So these are the common problems that should be responsibility of the OIM contractor. And of course, there are 
other factors that might be not be controlled uh, control and are not responsible of the APC and the bind contractor, that is that those environmental factors that we are showing here. Uh, generally speaking, the, the report that we provide, of course, we just make a general summary and we, uh, we say how is the performance of the, of the site. So we propose what we mentioned before, we propose what things should be improved at the operational level and also what is the potential things to modify in order to increase the performance of the site. We try to always give very relevant, very relevant to the economical impact directly uh, to prove what is the potential uh, revenues that we will increase uh, if we are handling different uh, upgrading actions and what is the losses that we are having right now uh, on yearly basis. And of course, we make our proposal for the uh, taking over these, these assets. So that's it. Uh, I think we take a, I take a little bit more time than, than I should, but uh, uh, of course, it's like whatever other question, uh, we are here to, to answer. No problem, David. Thank you for your insights. Uh, very interesting presentation. We still have a, a couple of minutes for Q&A. Let's run shortly into that. If you still haven't uh, put your questions up for the presenters, uh, you have uh, a couple of seconds to do it now and we will start shortly. Okay, let's... Uh, a first question uh, for you, David. Um, of all the elements that you presented, what is that gets overlooked or forgotten more often? And uh, is this is different for a different kind of buyers? For instance, financial funds versus more technical IPP buying. Well, I mean, the findings, you really, uh, I mean, it is very, very broad and very, very different. They're the really the findings in the, in the technical due diligence. Uh, what we really can, can detect is that the, uh, the results of the technical due diligence in Japan, of course, are a little bit different than in other countries. Um, basically, it's because, um, the, the, in the, especially in the first couple of years, 2012, 2013, might be many projects that uh, were not uh, built in the, let's say, global standard, and they might be many companies that they were starting construction activities at that moment and were not considered uh, many elements that were much more uh, implemented globally in you know, other by, by by global APC companies. So. So we saw many uh, basic problems and problems that we don't find in other countries, okay? But, uh, but uh, we cannot uh, say that normally we have uh, some specific problems uh, uh, that are coming more here than in other countries. It's also uh, significant in Japan that uh, how, how the, the potential uh, owners of the, the assets may not pay attention to the warranties of the products as much as in other countries. Again, uh, I would say that uh, the warranties, it is uh, the, the product warranties, especially, of course, the, the modules and the inverters are products that are uh, critical. And, and of course, uh, those uh, sophisticated contracts are much more carefully detailed in globally. And maybe in Japan, they were a little bit more basic and for that, some potential uh, uh, material complaints were, ha were handled not uh, that easily after finding some, some endemic problems in, in some due diligence. Clear, David. Thank you. Uh, now we have a question uh, for Eugene. Uh, Eugene, do you see appetite of Japanese buyers for assets developed by non-Japanese sellers? And is this changing? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think um, I, I've definitely worked on a few transactions where um, you know we have uh, assets that were developed by um, well developers. I mean, there's obviously a development team in Japan, but by a foreign sponsor, if you will. Um, and 
um, with open exit to a, a, a Japanese not not listed but um, you know unlisted funds. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's it's not so much you know who the developer and what the name is. It's 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 a cash flow play, it's a yield play, and, and it'll depend on you know what what the performance is and and uh, and how comfortable they can get with um, you know, the 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 actual performance matching projections and things like that. But um, so from that perspective, I, I don't think they see it, um, you know, solar plants so much as a branded or um, um, to sponsor as much as, you know, can, what what's, what are the economics look like? And that, at least that's my experience. Okay, thank you, Eugene. Uh, we we don't have uh, more, more questions uh, for you. So uh, seems like has been a very clear explanation. So thanks a lot. I, I want to ask you, will you be available at the conference for a detail and confidential discussion about what you just presented? Yes, sure. I, I think um, um, one of the presentations that we're doing, um, we'll be going over um, some of the topics discussed today, but in a little bit more detail um, and introducing some of the, you know, the complexity that comes um, with trying to transition from equity structures into more favorable structures. That, that is one of the major problems that we see. Um, with a lot of uh, the secondary transactions that have worked on. Perfect. Uh, one last question because we need to round off, and this is for David. Uh, is it realistically possible in some cases to compress a technical assessment to three or four weeks, maintaining the scope that you just explained? <clears throat> Again, three or four weeks, uh, we should be in the, in the limit. I mean, we committed the... Uh, we committed four weeks, four or five weeks is something that we normally committed. But basically, I mean, the key element to comply on that is the the, the collection of the information, and and that's it. It's like it's, it's something that uh, is in the, in the very limit what we can do. We can do. Okay. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Eugene. Uh, also, thanks to all of our audience that join us today for your input and participation. I hope that the webinar was of value to you. Um, if you have any further questions or remarks, please uh, contact me. Here you can see the contact details or any of my colleagues that are directly involved in Solar Assets Management Asia, uh, Stefano Kruku and Saori Minamino. So thank you on, on behalf of them as well. Um, we hope to see you in Solar Asset Management uh, Asia in the 8th and 9th of June or at any other um, conference either in the Netherlands, Singapore uh, or at other Solar Asset Management conferences in Chile and Italy. So we are looking forward to see you there. Uh, have a great evening or a good day and goodbye.